the last Bible study time, and uh, some of you have expressed yourself to me that you've enjoyed it, and I'd like to tell you this, I enjoy digging into the Word of God. There's nothing that can mean more to us. I suppose that some of you almost think that my topic was the attributes of deity, but if you'll remember, my topic was high concepts of God. And we find them, I think that I told you right at the beginning, I don't see that I have my note here before me, but that we were going to see the high concepts of God in the Decalogue and in the Exodus and in the names of God and in the attributes of God, and we have gone through a number of them. And I'm not through with the attributes, but I would like to go to a couple of the other topics for a few minutes this morning because I would at least like to touch on them. And I think that we can see some required high concepts of God in the biblical requirements of worship. And I would like to take just a few moments on that this morning. I think that, and I hope it's not you and me when we say we, but uh, we have all too often been careless about our worship of the great God in heaven. And I've noticed some things in the scripture that suggest that there are some high requirements of worship, maybe not all found in the New Testament, but like someone was saying to me, says, well, wh what do you do with this? It's, this is Old Testament. And I said, no, it's not Old Testament, it's Bible. The whole thing is the Word of God. So I would like to call your attention to some of the requirements of worship that are suggested in the Day of Atonement. There's one thing that's especially interesting, and of course, when we speak of the high priest of Israel, we have to take that over to ourselves as individuals because we do not have a high priest now. But there was one interesting thing. The Lord said, you can't go any time you please into the inner uh, holy of holies. And I think that we ought to realize that that is a sacred privilege, not that we shouldn't go into the house of God at all times, but we ought to realize that God wanted his people to so regard the place of worship that they couldn't just run in and out of the holy place any time they please. But there was one day of the year, and there were some special things that seemed like maybe, I think possibly the Pharisees made something of them. They shouldn't have, but I think perhaps I don't believe we need to follow the letter of this, but I believe the spirit of it, we need something of this. They were to even be sure that their bodies were clean when they went into the Holy of Holies and into the holy place. They were to bathe, they were to wear holy garments, and they were to set aside all ordinary work on that special day. And all of this was to teach them that they were to have high conceptions of the worship of the great God whose throne is the heavens and whose footstool is the earth. And also there were offerings, offerings of incense, offerings of fire, offerings of blood, and perhaps there was some suggestion in each one of those. The uh, offerings of incense surely speak of the fragrance of prayer, and we have had that part of worship in this camp meeting much of the time. And uh, there was the symbol of fire, and I'm sure that we all know what that means. That means it isn't just an ordinary thing, but there's something that seems unusual in the presence of God. I remember one time when we were uh, holding street meetings, and it was in a kind of a carnival situation where Main Street was roped off, and, and uh, just about everything went on at that time. And uh, it was a hard thing to hold a crowd. We'd, we'd line up at the curb, generally two, two boys at the curb, and then a girl and a boy and a girl and a boy. You know why we did it that way? Also, there was a boy always there to give a shoulder to the drunks as they staggered into our line. It wasn't just an easy place to preach, but we tried it. But it was pretty hard to stop the crowds. But I remember one time while we were holding those meetings, a tent caught on fire not very far away from us, and do you know that fire really drew the crowd? There's something about fire that will draw the crowd. And about one or two nights after that, I remember we were praying in the prayer room before we went down to hold the street meeting, and uh, I remember I was kneeling at some big box or trunk in the prayer room, and I had my hand out like this, and I said, Lord, you said if two or three would agree, and just about that time I felt a hand come down on mine and said, Lord, you said if two or three would agree, 
And uh, I think most of you will know what I mean when I say our prayers didn't stop at the ceiling and they went right straight through to heaven when there was two of us agreeing. Then I want to tell you what happened that night. It happened just about like it did when that tent caught fire. But we went down there and started to hold our services, and God came on that little band of us. And I remember there were two of us that were kind of in charge of it, and he went out and preached so hard that he lost his voice, and he stepped back into the ring and motioned to me to go out, and I went out and preached as hard as I could till I lost my voice, and then he went out again, and I went out again, and you know, the crowds just jammed around our little service that night. I remember well because we were near a movie theater, and the manager came out and telling us to move because we were blocking the entrance to the theater. Well, we had a right to be where we were, so we didn't move. But the thing that I'm trying to say is the fire of that tent that drew a crowd, the fire of God when it was in our hearts and in the service, that also drew a crowd. And if you'll notice, there were times when they must go into the worship of God with incense, with fire, and with blood. Now, you know I'm not saying that we need to have a ritual when we come into the house of God, but I wonder if we don't need what those things stood for in their symbols. The fragrance of prayer, the zeal of fire, and the cleansing of the precious blood. There were seven solemn times of sprinkling of the blood, and there were bathings, and there were holy garments, and there was one ritual after another. And as we read in the case of when Zacharias was in the temple, the crowd was waiting outside just breathless to see if their worship was going to be accepted that year. Now, I read this one time, and I haven't been able to find it again, but that they, that they did, and I guess it was a custom, that to tie a rope to the priest's foot in case he worshipped a miss and was struck dead in the Holy of Holies so they could pull him out. I've read that once and I've been assured by others that it's a true thing that that was a custom. Whether God meant that or not, I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is there was a solemnity that belonged to the worship of God that I think we need to have. And I don't mean the solemnity of quietness and the stillness of death, but a solemnity I'm coming into the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, there were other times of worship that showed that they had to be careful about worship. Now, would you remember my topic? High concepts of God. And God requires some special things in our worship. I've often thought that it would be something for our ordinations if we did like the ordination of the priests did, when they would linger in the tabernacle for seven days and nights just praying that God would bless them, I wonder if that wouldn't do something for our ordination services. If we had, again, I'm saying that's typical, and yet there was some meaning to it. Their garments were to be garments of holiness and beauty, and there was to be light on that worship. But do you know what kind of light it was? It was light that only God could approve. It was this side of the tabernacle, wasn't it? On this side, as if I were facing the east door, it would be on this side was that seven-branched candlestick, and there was no light allowed in the tabernacle but that which came from the golden candlestick and from the oil which God had appointed, a type of the Holy Spirit and the light that he sheds on our worship. And I wonder again if that wouldn't be something that we ought to give some consideration to. And then, lest I forget it, I see I made a note here to remind us that not only was there ritual in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament said, if you come to the place of worship and realize there's something in your heart that ought not to be there, you better forget your worship and go out there and straighten up with that brother or sister. And I wouldn't be surprised if that would do something for a service. I was in a very unusual revival service one time. I don't think I'll ever forget it, but God came down in that scene, and there was a man in that congregation, easy to remember him, he must have been six foot four or five tall, and he was a good, upright man, but he had some rather hard and harsh ways. I think he meant nothing but to be spiritual, but he had some harsh ways. And I remember when God came down in that service, I can still almost see him. He stood up back like in that part of the church, and it was a fair-sized church, not nearly, of course, as large as this, but I suppose it would have held 300 people, perhaps. And that man stood up in the back of that church, and you could just see him. He had his head bowed like this, and you could almost sense he was saying, Lord, who do you want me to apologize to next? 
And he'd stand there, and pretty soon you'd see him go off to this side of the church and bend over someone that was kneeling in prayer and make his apology. Of course, we don't know what he said, but we knew he was a harsh man, and we knew what he was doing. And then he'd go back and stand there again in that place, just with his head bowed like he was waiting for God to speak, and then he'd move over to someone else. You know, I guess I'd like to see a few services like that again, wouldn't you? Where God so came down that we were just standing in awe of the presence of God and said, Lord, do I have to straighten up? Anything? I'll tell you, I thought that, Brother Foster, when you were preaching. And I was trying to go over it. Is there something that if light became greater or my memory became keener, I would know there's some serious thing I've got to straighten up. And I don't know that there is. My restitutions have been small financially. Five dollars, five cents, and 25 cents. But I had to make them. I had to make them, but my restitutions or adjustments were pretty big when it came to making some apologies and confessions. And I remember one time when I was seeking the Lord, and I felt like God was telling me to do something. And uh, it was a difficult thing to do, and I struggled with it a little while. And all of a sudden I said yes, and I meant it, and God knew that I meant it, and it was just like a flashlight went off in my soul, the light that burst in, into my heart. When I said that, yes, I hadn't done it yet, but I meant to do it, and God knew I meant to do it. And I believe that we ought to more highly regard our times of worship than we do. I think you've understood by now some of the things I've said, that this ought to solve all of that. I'll be forgiven because I, I, after this service I don't speak anymore, and all you can do is scowl at me after this. But it looks to me like these high concepts of the worship of God ought to forever handle gum chewing and reading papers and whispering and, and disturbing and things like that in the house of God. It's something I just can't hardly understand. And I believe it's a wicked thing to do something that distracts someone else's attention in the service. And I wanted to turn to the scripture, but I didn't, and I can't find it right off. But I believe it's in Amos where the, God brought a charge against his people for sitting in the place of worship and at the same time thinking, now let's see, what can I do to make more money tomorrow? Now what about, you know, you remember what it was? Saying, you say, how will we handle the wheat or handle the oil or something like that? And God brought a charge against his people for letting their minds wander to secular business when they were supposed to be about the business of worshiping God. Let me give you a little more of the terrible solemnity of the worship of God. You remember how Nadab and Abihu thought that they could just worship in any way they pleased? And what happened to them? God struck them dead. Now, I don't believe that's hardly ever going to happen in our day. Perhaps never will happen, but it happened once and it was recorded as a symbol to us. We better be careful how we go about the worship of God. And could I just take a few moments to illustrate a little something from the tabernacle of ancient Israel? I think it's very interesting. I won't pick on anyone, but you know how the tabernacle well, it wasn't very big. It was, what is it, 15 feet wide and 45 feet long. The Holy of Holies was 30 feet by 15. I mean, the holy place was 30 by 15, and the Holy of Holies was 15 by 15 by 15 high. And around, around that was the uh, court of the tabernacle of curtains that were seven and a half feet high, I believe. And they were, what was it, 75 feet one way and 150 feet the other. And the nearest tents of the children of Israel, of the sons of Levi, were one third of a mile away. And the nearest tents of the people I've kind of forgotten, but I believe it was about a mile or a mile and a half away. Now, can I give you a little bit of an illustration from that? You've got that picture. Suppose old brother, whoever he was, let's say Zachariah, had done something he oughtn't to do, and he'd got in trouble with the Lord and maybe with his neighbor, and he decided that he's time to get this fixed up, and he's going to go up there to the tabernacle and make an offering and get things straightened up. And if he's like a lot of people today, he's going to slip in so no one will notice it. You think he can slip in so no one will notice it? Everybody at their tent door that day looked out, and they saw him walking for a mile and a half across that open space with his lamb going up, and they said, he's finally making it straight. You couldn't, you couldn't keep it hidden. And then when you got a little bit closer, you had to get past the tents of the Levites. 
And that was about a third of a mile. And then he had a third of a mile yet to go. And you know what he came to then? He came to Moses' tent on one side and Aaron's on the other. And he somehow had to make a satisfactory explanation to them before he could even start to straighten things up. I wonder if maybe something like that wouldn't help us sometimes. If we had to walk a mile and a third leading a lamb and everyone know he's finally going to straighten it up. I'd like to give you another little something that I think is interesting on the high conceptions of God so far as our worship goes, and that's found in Exodus 20, 26. That's the same chapter as the Decalogue is found in, and uh, I, I'm just positive there won't be anybody in this congregation will say what was said about me one time when I spoke in a, it was a youth camp, and I just said a very little about modesty and plainness of dress, and the speaker that followed me got up and said that God didn't require you to look like your grandmother. Well, I hadn't said that God required you to look your, like your grandmother. I just said God required you to be modest and plain and holy. But here's something. You can take it and apply it to yourself. But the Lord said of the priests in the worship, they weren't even to go up by steps to the altar of God. They were supposed to have an inclined plane so they could walk up like that. And you know why God said they were to do that? So as they were walking up, they wouldn't kick their skirts up and expose a part of their body in worship. Now, that, that's right in the same chapter as thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness. In that same chapter, it says, have even the approach to the place of worship such that a man's body is not going to be exposed. And that wouldn't be very much, would it? About so much of the lower limbs when he kicked those skirts as he was going up high steps. And so God said, you don't go up by steps to my altar, but you go up by an inclined plane. Now, nobody's going to say, I said you had to look like your grandmother, are you? Here's another one that's interesting to me. You remember how impetuous Peter was? He could get so excited and just do anything just in the spur of the moment. And yet when he was in the boat that day and they saw someone on the shore and John said, that's the Lord. And Peter said, I'm getting right out there to see him just as quick as I can. But do you know what he did first? He tied his robe about him before he went into the presence of the Lord. As excited as he was, he was probably uh, stripped down like we'd say to had his shirt off maybe, or however we would say that, in the hard work of rowing and pulling in nets and fishing. But he said, there's Jesus and I'm going to cover up before I get over there in his presence. He rose above his impetuosity and said, I had to be careful. Uh, I know you're not going to get after me, but would you either smile or say amen so that I know it's not too bad what I've just said to you. It ought to do something about these things. And I think that it's a, a high recommendation of this camp that it's not allowed that we stand outside there at the door uh, playing and wasting time and being foolish when the services are going on. And I believe that these things that I mentioned to you here would argue for those very same things to be. All right, perhaps enough on that. On strict requirements of the worship of God shows some of the high conceptions of God. Now again, I'm going to leave a few of the uh, attributes and go to the theophanies or appearances of God, how we ought to have high conceptions of God. I've copied a bit of this song here. I want to read it. I'm sure all of you perhaps know it, and especially the singers. When God speaks, the high mountains tremble. When God speaks, the loud billows roll. When God speaks, my heart falls to listening, and there is response in my soul. When God speaks, the angels obey him. When God speaks, all nature is stirred. When God speaks, the hard hearts are softened, for no sweeter voice e'er was heard. And I read that to lead you up to this thought that we've seen so much of this in our day, and I can't say I heard anybody in this camp say it. In fact, I have not, but I have been in many places where you'd hear something like this. Uh, well, it amounted to this. God and I had a chat this morning. I said to God, and God said to me, and I said to God, and God said to me, and, and I told the Lord this, and the Lord said that to me. You know, I believe there's something wrong with that approach. When God speaks, the heart falls to listening. When God speaks, the high mountains tremble. Let me give you a few pictures of how the saints of old felt when God appeared to them. Now, I don't want to say that God doesn't appear and speak. I just want to say that it's a solemn and awful thing 
when the omnipotent God deigns to speak to one of his creatures. And maybe I'll not try and explain that any further. Moses at the burning bush is an illustration of the awe that we ought to have when God appears to us and speaks to us. You remember what it was? I remember reading where someone who may have known a little bit about philosophy and science but sure didn't know much about religion, said the very most important thing, I believe is the way he put it, the important thing was to notice Moses' scientific curiosity, that he saw a bush that was burning and it wasn't burned up. That's not it at all. The most important thing of all to notice is that Moses felt a divine presence there, and he drew near, and he heard that voice of God say, Moses, you're standing on holy ground, and Moses said, I take off my shoes then, and my heart falls to listening. I believe we need some high concepts of our visiting times with God Almighty. They're not visits like they are with some ordinary human being. And then let me give you another one, and I'd like to say this. Nobody will understand this verse except the people that have experienced it. Genesis 17:17, 17, 17. and so you won't need to turn to look it up. I'll tell you what it is. It says that the Lord was talking to Abraham and now, will you let me just put it in ordinary common language? And Abraham got so blessed that he just fell down on the ground and laughed. Did you ever get blessed that much? Some folks never have been. But it wasn't a little thing when God spoke to Abraham. Abraham said, why, is God really speaking to me? Is God going to fulfill that marvelous promise to me? And he just got so blessed that he fell on his face. And over in John, I believe it's chapter 8 and 56, Christ was speaking to the Jews, and he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And I believe it was in that promise in Genesis 17:17, 17, 17, where Abraham said, I, I don't really understand this, but God's talking to me something about the future, about the Redeemer that's coming that was promised to Adam and Eve and then to Seth and then on down through the line. And Abraham lived about the year 1800 B.C., so for 2,000 years there had been a promise. And now Abraham said, you know, I believe God's going to fulfill part of that promise through me. And he got so blessed he just fell down his face and laughed. I'm not going to ask how many have had that experience. I will just tell you this. You'll understand Abraham better when you have an experience like that. I, I'll have to say I haven't had many of them, but I have had them. Isaiah's vision of God is another illustration of the appearances of God ought to teach us high concepts of God. And actually, I don't know how to explain it any better than just quote a little bit of it. I suppose I can quote at least a good part of it. In the year that King Uzziah died, and can I slip this in? The thing that is most outstanding in my memory is Uzziah's funeral. Was that it? No, he just passed from that. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And that was a big thing that interested Isaiah. And I believe that that's the thing that influenced his preaching from that day on. That marvelous 35th chapter, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. And uh, uh, all of the beauties in that, the lame man shall leap in the heart, the dumb, dumb tongue will sing, and eyes of the blind will be opened. And I just have to tell you this, this is so good. And I'm getting a complex. I got these Hebrew scholars in this place. I don't know how many of them there are, but it seems like they're on every side. But anyway, I looked this up, and I think I'm right on it, that where it says uh, the parched ground, that that parched ground there meant a mirage. And you know what a mirage is? A mirage looks like there's water. And they say that some of those mirages are so real out in the desert that it will look like there's not only water, in the distance, but they'll actually think that they see palm trees and green grass, and the whole thing just uh, lo looks like the real thing of what they've been longing for across that desert march. But the scripture says the parched ground will become a pool. In other words, that's saying if you had a life that's been so dry that you just have to say everything that I thought was blessing is a mirage, the Lord is saying that when Christ comes, he can do something for you until you'll say the parched ground, the mirage, is actually a pool of water now. And there's refreshing in that. But let me go on with this vision of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And do you suppose Isaiah was gum chewing or biting his fingernails or something like that? I don't believe he was. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain they covered their face. 
with twain they covered their feet, and with twain they did fly. And I meant to speak, as I was speaking of the requirements of worship, when the seraphim stood before God Almighty, say what you will, I think there's something significant. They covered themselves from head to foot to stand in the presence of God for worship. And they cried one to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Isaiah, he wasn't flippant about it. He wasn't at all flippant. He said, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I am undone. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And I like what one preacher friend of mine said. He said, Then flew one of the seraphim. It wasn't six months later, but when that cry from the heart came, Woe is me, I am undone. Then, right then, flew one of the seraphim and touched his coal, lips with a live coal from off the altar of God. And someone has said that in that chapter then of that vision of Isaiah, there's the woe of a revelation. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And there's a low of a cleansing. Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And then the goal of a great commission, go tell this people. And you know, I'm not sure that any of us are really equipped for going with the commission until we've had the low of the cleansing and the woe of the heart. This isn't a part of what I am trying to speak about this morning, but I'd just like to say it in this place. I don't know how to illustrate it. Maybe I can illustrate it this way. I remember one time in one of my Greek classes, which happened to be one of the classes when God very often broke into the class, and we'd have times of prayer, and I, I don't think I'll ever remember how one of those boys, one of the finest students in the school, he stood up in the back of the classroom. I was in the front, of course, as a teacher. He stood up and said, I've got carnality in my heart, ha, 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 something like that. I want to tell you that the night that God tore back the veil from my heart when I saw carnality, Brother West, I'm not using a figure of speech. It bent my head and it bent my back for three days before I could straighten up again. It is not a little thing to see the revelation of your heart. And I don't know how to tell you. This isn't a part of my preaching. This belongs to the evangelists of the camp. But I remember it was just like God pulled a veil back and let me see my heart. And I want you to know I'm not bragging. I'm just saying the fact I was not a bad person. I grew up feeling it was wrong to smoke or drink or gamble or play cards, and I never did a one of them. And basically, I was a good person. I'm saying that to illustrate this. When God tore back the veil from my heart, I saw a corruption in there that let me know that my carnality was akin to all the carnality there is in the world. And again, I'm telling you, it was three days before I could straighten up my head and straighten up my back when I saw what was in my heart. And there's going to be more of that when we see the Lord high and lifted up there's going to be more of that, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. And then there be, may be more of this, the seraphim flying with the live coal from off the altar and saying, you've seen your need, and now God's going to satisfy that need, and the need is the fire of the Holy Ghost. All right, maybe that's enough to speak of Isaiah's vision. I don't have notes on this, but I want you to turn with me to the uh, first chapter of Ezekiel, and show you a little bit what, about what a vision of God meant to Ezekiel. I believe I can find Ezekiel. Notice some of the things in this. Do you think that it would be a vivid memory to you if you met God and God really showed you something outstanding. I hope I haven't given the impression that I think God does not meet with his people frequently. I'm talking about those appearances that could be called, what shall I say, outstanding. Let's say that we're asking Ezekiel a question and say, Ezekiel, can you, can you remember when it was that you said that you met God in that unusual way? All right, here it is. Now it came to pass the 30th year, the fourth month and the fifth day. He said, I can tell you just, just when it happened, and I'll venture to say he could tell you what time it was, if they had some kind of timekeeping things. And he said, I was among the captives by the rivers 
by the river of Kibar, and the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. It was the fifth day of the month, the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. And then he goes on, the fourth verse, he said, I look, and I want you to notice something particularly in this vision. Ezekiel just as much as said, I simply can't describe it to you. I can't tell you what it's like, but it was, it was kind of like, 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 he said, I can't tell you what it really looked like, but I can tell you something what it was kind of like. And he said, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. They had four faces and four wings and their feet were straight and so on. And they sprinkled, they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. They had hands of a man and so on. And uh, I noticed some other things there. Their wings were joined. They didn't turn one way or the other. And let's go on over to uh, about the 15th verse. As I beheld the living creatures, a wheel upon the earth by the living creatures and his four faces, and the appearance, he doesn't say that these were wheels, but he said it was the appearance of the wheels, and their work, he didn't say it was the color of a burl, but it was like the color of a burl, and they had one likeness and their appearance, the wheel in the middle of a wheel and so on. And then let me go over here just a little bit further. In the 26th verse, no, I want the 25th verse. There was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads where they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man. Do you notice how he's as much as saying, I can't really describe this to you, but it was like a throne, it was like a firmament, it was like a man, it was like the appearance. Ezekiel said something happened in that 30th year, the fourth month and the fifth day, that I'm just never going to get over. And then, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. No, I didn't want to read that again. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about, I'm skipping down parts of it, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, it had brightness about it, and did this impress Ezekiel to feel like, well, I can just go on my way? No, he did as John did in that picture in Revelation, and when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard the voice of one that spake. There's a, it's a pretty solemn thing to come into a visitation of God when he moves in his special ways. There's one thing that's needed for me, I think, to speak on this like I would like to, and that's to be freed from the trammels of this high chair and be able to get out there in the aisle and tell you just how I feel about it. Would you like to turn to the book of Daniel, the 10th chapter? Follows Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 10 and verses 1 through 9. Daniel was praying before the Lord, and he says when it was his third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in those days I was mourning three full weeks. Maybe that's a part of the answer to it too. A three-week-long time of prayer. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine into my mouth. And uh, he saw when he lifted up his eyes in verse 5, I beheld a certain man clothed in linen. His loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body was like the burl. His face is the appearance of lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And he said, I saw it. And in verse 8, he said, I was left alone and there remained no more strength in me. It's a solemn thing to come into the presence of God. And then perhaps to, to me, one of the most outstanding of all is one I tried to read a little from on Sunday morning, the appearance of Christ to John in the first chapter of Revelation. And I'm not going to read that over again except maybe pick out a few verses in it. Oh, about from verse 10 to 20, some interesting things there. He said... Uh, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes as a flame of fire, his feet like undefined brass. His voice is a sound of many waters. In his right hand, a sharp sword. There were some solemn things that John saw when he saw that appearance and vision of Christ. Then I want to call your attention to one more Old Testament 
vision of God that uh, I've tried to preach from a time or two that has uh, Habakkuk. Chapter, uh, chapter 3. I would like for you to turn to that, if you will. Does this sound a little bit like something of modern, the just, oh well, God was there? I like it. I think I can go away from Stoneboro Camp and say God was there, not just in his, what shall I say, ordinary omnipresence, but he was there in his specially manifested presence in preaching and in singing and in praying and testifying, and it's been a wonderful thing to me. But now I want you to look at this vision of Habakkuk in the third chapter. O oh Lord, I have heard thy voice, and I just went on my way like I was before. Does it say that? O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech, and I was afraid. It's a solemn thing to come into the presence of God and hear his voice and, as it were, see the appearance of God. And one thing I felt like when I heard the Lord, heard thy speech and was afraid, I felt like, Lord, I've got to pray, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. Doesn't this sound like Habakkuk saw something pretty wonderful? Verse 3, God came, his glory covered the heavens, his glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. And in the fourth verse, his brightness was as the light. And I think we should read that word horns as rays. He had rays coming out of his hand, but even still there was the hiding of his power. Now let me move on a little bit further here. Verse 6, he stood and measured the earth and beheld. He drove asunder the nation and the everlast the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered, the perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Verse 8, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? And uh, I want to find one other here. Verse 11, the sun and the moon stood still in their habitation to the light of thine arrows. I haven't found the one I, I was wanting to see, see yet. I probably won't see it now. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. Yes, the 16th verse. That shows how Habakkuk was solemnized when he saw a vision of God. When I heard, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at the rottenness in my bones. I trembled in myself that I may rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. And now let me give to you what is the result of this vision of God that Habakkuk saw, and I, I really love this. Uh, how can I illustrate it? If you say, well, it just seems like the Lord isn't going to bless anymore. I don't know if God's going to help me or not. And, and I'm just pretty discouraged about how things are going. You just look and see how things just, they don't look like there's going to be blessing again. I want you to read with me from verse 17. Follow along as I read. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, that would be pretty bad, no crops. Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. There shall be no herd in the stall. That looks like total bankruptcy, doesn't it? Yet Habakkuk says, I have seen God, and I'll tell you what it's going to do for me. Yet, in spite of that, I'll rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he'll make my feet like hind's feet, and he'll make me to walk on high places. It looks like it does something when a person meets God, and I think that these scriptures that I've read to you are to illustrate this topic that I've tried to choose. High concepts of God are shown in the theophanies of God. Just one more, and I'll close with that. I mean, I'll close this section. Don't get too encouraged yet. I'll close this section. And that's Paul's vision. And that's something that has stirred my heart because I felt like Paul's experience on the Damascus Road and the, the marvelous meeting with Christ struck a chord in my own heart that said, I never had an experience like Paul had, but I had an experience that helps me to understand it. I never had an experience like Isaiah had, but I had an experience that helps me to understand that. And so here it is. There are about three things that I just called your attention. He was struck to the ground. He, he was blinded by the glory of that appearance, and he was subdued and conquered forever. 
when he met the Christ. And if you've never read it, I'd like to recommend to your reading Six Letters on the Spiritual Manifestation of the Son of God by John Fletcher. He takes up some comparisons of Paul's call to the ministry with our own ministry of today. I think I'll close with this next section. I really thought I ought to close earlier this last day because I'm sure we're growing weary. But I want to take up one more thought on the high concepts of God from some great scriptures. I'm not going to try and talk about them, but just maybe make a comment and read the scripture and give you the reference. But it seems to me these ought to almost overwhelm us. Number one, Hebrews 11.2. Now, I'm not a student of science, but I do know how the world was made. Don't you? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. He just spoke and said, let there be, and there was. At one word, Christians have the answer that philosophers and scientists are seeking. One time I thought, I said quite a little bit about philosophy and, and made, made some critical remarks about it. And I thought, well, maybe it'd be a good thing for me to just do a little bit of studying about philosophy so I know what I'm talking about. So I did a little bit of study. And you know what I found out basically that the philosophers are doing? They're trying to find out if somewhere there's a great first cause and originator of all things. And I thought, I'm ahead of them already, because I know that. And I've said this, the crowds don't even have any questions. The philosophers have questions, and the Christians got answers. And it looks to me like that's a whole lot better. And through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of, his, word of God. And then Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, now, I tried to speak on the attributes of deity. I did the very best that I could. Tried to give a picture of some of the things. Let me see if I can give you a little picture here, just a little picture. Uh, suppose that you would take a saucer of water. Now, I think a saucer is the word that I want to use. Anyway, a shallow dish. And fill it full of water and run around this tabernacle just as fast as you could. And whether you stumbled or how, whether it went fast or slow, that you wouldn't slop a drop over one side or the other. Well, I don't know how fast you'd go. How fast would you go? Would you go five miles an hour? Maybe something like that. But the Lord whirls this world around at a thousand miles an hour and sends it around the sun at 18 and a half miles a second, and those waters never spill over. And do you know what he put up there to stop them? Just sand. Just sand. But he upholds, now if you believe the Bible, this is what it says, he's the brightness of the glory of God, and if you want to know what God's like, know what Jesus Christ is like, the express image of his person, and if you want to know what he does, he upholds all things by the greatest straining of his omnipotence? No, just the word of his power. It keeps all of that, and it's more than that. And let me give you another scripture, this time in, Gal in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Now, just think about everything. Well, I'm just going to ask you, just think about this scripture as I read it. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. They hold together. I don't just understand it. I believe it's the second law of thermodynamics says that everything has a tendency to decay and disintegrate and fail, but he upholds all things by the word of his power and by him all things consist. Let me read you another great verse to give us a high concept of God from great scriptures. It's so, I think I've got it memorized and I think you have too, John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And I just wondered if there's someone out there in the crowd saying, Brother Carroll, all you're telling us is some scriptures that we memorized a long time ago. But let me ask you this. Have you thought about them like you ought to? And say there's some high concepts of God that I've been failing to see. One more and I'll close. Revelation 19.6. And I heard, how about it, I, whether you're dismissed or not, how about let's stand and read it together. Revelation 19.6.
Pause a little bit at the commas, stop at the periods, and we'll read it together, shall we? Have you got it? Revelation 19.6. And read it like you might feel if you were there to join the crowd that says hallelujah. All right, are we ready? And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voices of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. You may be seated. <clears throat> 